that, I would now like to introduce our keynote speaker this evening, Peter Goldmark. I've known Peter for many, many years, and he's had a remarkable and multifaceted career. Peter's been active in both the private sector and public sector, and has helped shape much of the work that we do, and his professional history is intertwined with LISC. In the late 1970s, Peter was a close friend and advisor to Mike Sverdorf, LISC's founder and first president, as the concept of a national community development intermediary that would become LISC was formed and fleshed out. Peter then became one of the original members of the board of LISC. Later, as a visionary president of the Rockefeller Foundation, Peter was the architect of the National Community Development Initiative, now known as Living Cities, a consortium of private corporations and foundations whose support has been essential to community development over many, many years, and whose support has also helped make LISC and the Enterprise Foundation true national organizations. Over the years, Peter has also served as Budget Director for the State of New York, Secretary for Health and Human Services for the State of Massachusetts, Executive Director of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Chief Executive Officer of the International Herald Tribune, and Director of the Climate and Air Program for the Environmental Defense Fund. We are extremely grateful to have Peter as our guest tonight and his many years of friendship and contribution to LISC. Please welcome our speaker tonight, Peter Goldmark. So here we are, celebrating the birthday of an organization with just about the most obscure, clunky name in history. Lisk. Sounds like an antacid. Sounds like something you'd put in your toilet to unclog it. It is, in fact, probably most of you don't know, it in fact was designed as a temporary name. I said to Sviridov early on, you, you remember that? I said to Sviridov, you can't have an organization with this name. People stumble over it, it's all abstract. He said, it's temporary, it's temporary. We'll change it. And here we are celebrating your 30th birthday in the 32nd year of your history in a place called the Museum of Portraiture. Another name that could use a little work. Sorry, Susan. <laughs> By the way, I trust you all saw the giant portrait of Michael Rubinger in the main gallery up there on the third floor. But despite some of these disheveled and disjointed circumstances, we gather at a moment in the history of Lith when there is, in fact, a lot to celebrate. We gather also at a moment in the history of our country when the nation is deeply troubled. You know, sometimes in life you have to set out to climb a mountain even if you're not exactly sure how you're going to do it. And I've got a story that recounts the history of just such an effort. It's your story, our story, if you'll let an old veteran count himself part of that history with you. So I want you to hold a picture in your mind, a picture of blocks, endless blocks of ravaged city landscape, rubble, waste, despair, battered cars with no wheels, families afraid to go outdoors, druggies selling radiator pipes for fixed money. And I want you to remember that this picture could have been of any of several score American cities. You can find hundreds, thousands of those pictures in newspapers and magazines of the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1980s, fewer in the 1990s, almost none in the 2000s. At the beginning of your efforts to address this blight, this cancer in the heart of our cities and our country, this plague that destroyed the lives of so many of the most vulnerable and consigned their children to dead ends and despair the moment they were born. At the beginning 
of your efforts, our efforts, did we really know how we were going to do it? No, we didn't. We had the valuable experience of the pioneering Bed-Stuy Corporation, but seminal as it was in some ways, other parts of that experience were clunky and expensive and not always applicable. We didn't know a lot about how to structure investments in center city renewal to bring banks and other mainline investors into it regularly at scale. I remember the day in the late 1980s when the CEO of JP Morgan looked at me and beamed, at last you've brought us an investable proposition. We had barely begun working towards wide scale tax credit financing. We weren't sure how to do it. And frankly, we didn't know if we could do it. It's hard to recall, now that so much progress has been made, how huge, daunting, and uncertain it looked like. We were not sure, as a country or as a group of people in community development, that we knew how to do this. Sometimes you have to set out to climb a mountain, even if you're not sure how you're going to do it. Well. We did an awful lot of it. We turned it around. There's a lot that remains to be done, and misery and poverty and social dysfunction have not been erased from our center cities. Have you been to Detroit lately? But the kind of physical ruin, the spiritual and social wasteland, the utter chaos, the overwhelming desolation and hopelessness that marked wide swaths of most of our urban cores, that is now largely past. Let me say that again, because there are many in this country who don't grasp the magnitude of what has been accomplished. The physical ruin, the spiritual and social wasteland, the utter chaos, the overwhelming desolation and hopelessness that marked the wide swaths of our greatest cities and defeated all goodwill, crushed all proud determination by single families or human beings. That is now largely past, and you cannot find those pictures today in our magazines and papers. Ask yourself this. In a country so full today of wrangling and doubt and polarization in the public arena, what in fact have been the great domestic successes of the past 30 years? You know, we as a country strangely do not have the habit of looking at the scoreboard very often. What were the big domestic successes of the past three decades? Not management of our budgetary affairs, not investment in and modernization of our infrastructure, not addressing global warming, which remains a huge and growing threat, not dramatically improving public education, although there are some good signs now, not getting health care straightened out. Nope, by my count, there were two large, game-changing domestic successes not unrelated to each other. One was sharply lowering the crime rate through community policing and other techniques. And the second is what you did, establishing and then taking to scale the largest and most successful effort this country has ever known to rebuild neighborhoods. I think it's okay to feel good about what you've done. It is a huge achievement. I think it's okay to feel good about that for about 15 minutes. Because there are mountains out there. And this organization is strong enough, special enough, seasoned enough, and secure financially enough to climb some of them. And few are. You are strong, and few others are. You're strong enough to do it again. There are several mountains out there, but I'm going to focus on one. I looked through some of your material that Mike sent me for tonight. I found a summary that noted 132 schools financed, 157 child care centers supported, 40 million square feet of retail community space, and other impressive feats. But I did not see a number for the continuing jobs created. And we've got to crack that one. A sixth or more of this country is out of work, and the recovery is stuttering, not roaring. And I don't think it's going to roar. We have to design and test and show that we can make work a community-based model for getting low-income folks to work. Here's my initial list of the elements it will need. 
You can improve on it. Number one, the local vehicle should be specially incorporated, high supported work, high support for the workers' service job businesses. There should be a mechanism whereby any private sector corporation who wishes to join the program and enroll low-income, out-of-work folks can do so. Three, it should be a bid-for-contract model, though one that varies by situation, location, and sector. Four, it should include a strong OJT component graduated for people at different stages of work readiness. Five, and it will need a subsidy component, reaching perhaps as high as a third of employee base salary. Now, something like this needs testing, careful design, a lot of changes and refinement. But if we create a model that works fairly well, as well as we did in neighborhood renewal, let's say it puts 50% of those who enroll into continuing employment after a year. We will then have something that has legs and something that all sorts of institutions and organizations and corporations will want to buy into. The cost is not prohibitive. Let's take New York City. I did a little of the math for New York City because I know some of their numbers. Cost of such a program for every, and we're not going to do every right away, the cost of such a program for every low-income jobless person in New York City comes in under $3 billion a year. That is not too much for the city, state, and federal government to bear jointly, especially when you look at the benefits in terms of avoided welfare and unemployment costs, reduced load on subsidizing housing, shelter, and other services, and reduced crime. That's not only affordable, it's a good investment. And we do need to know from the outset that it's scalable. What kind of contract services am I imagining these corporations would perform? Security services, cleaning services, facility maintenance, recycling operations of all kinds, because that's going to grow, support and cleanup on construction sites, and a new field that will be enormous before this decade is out, energy retrofit of buildings, all kinds of buildings. Are there other mountains? Yes, but this one's been sitting there unclimbed for some time. So that's for the future. Not too far ahead, I hope, but the future. That's for tomorrow. For tonight, we celebrate and we take stock. And there's another reason for us to take stock. And that is, reason is that we are in trouble. We're in trouble as a country. Every one of us here this evening knows it. We know it in our bones, with our minds, in our spirit. We know it because this country at its best, so boisterous, so cocky, so sure of itself, so practical, is uncertain. We have lost some of our confidence in ourselves and in our democratic institutions. We are worried, not determined. We are hesitant, not sure-footed. We are vindictive and small-minded in the public sphere, not constructive or generous. And in our politics, we have become more ideological and less practical, more likely to attack our public institutions than to strengthen them. We seem unconscious of the fact that we are abandoning many of the most vulnerable among us and many of the values that have been at the center of our public concerns for a century. And for the moment, at any rate, we seem to have few leaders and few voices with the wit or the nerve to describe what we all know, that we're in trouble, that the clock is ticking, and that it's going to take some heavy lifting to get us back on a sensible path. So as we take stock, as we celebrate here, and as we case out the mountains ahead, let's be sure we understand the talents and the values that made this organization strong in the first place, and let us hold fast to them. LISC understood from the beginning that the critical center of what it undertook was not bricks and mortar. Bricks and mortar were the vehicle. What the vehicle nurtured and created was human and cooperation, an ethic of responsibility and self-help, neighborhood values and mutual obligations. Your Building Sustainable Communities initiatives exemplifies that. LISC understood that scale and impact could only come from harnessing mainline investors to its special tasks, and that this required accountability, 
financial prudence and absolute honesty and reliability. You have done that. And last of all, the point with which we began, Lisk knew that to seek the most important goals and to take on the most difficult tasks, that you had to attack them with discipline and imagination. Those two talents so rarely, rarely found in one place. Discipline and imagination without knowing how or even whether success would come at the end. Let's remember that. Let's remember that we are the custodians and the partners of an organization and a spirit that are among the highest performing and rarest and most needed in this country today. And in that spirit, let's raise our glasses together, not to the past 30 years, but to the next 30. Thank you.